Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Hello. 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 <laughs> it's fun. Everyone's everyone's piling in. We might wait just another moment as folks join us. So nice to see you all. Hi, Carolyn. It's Brenda. I don't know. Hi. Oh, hi. Yes, hello. I'm going to put my video on. Hey, how you hello. doing? Hello. Hi. Nice to see your nice face. To yeah, nice to meet you. You too. All right. Looking forward. Oh, and there's my mother. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Here. Toby Shoren, what person. up? <laughs> Children. see katie constable very cool welcome, welcome how exciting katie hauser wow okay very nice to see all you hi hi so um as we are all mostly here i believe um i am so excited to have with us today um caroline busta and lil internet um first an important statement uh, the Department of Design Media Arts at UCLA acknowledges our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Kich Gerileño Tongva peoples. We are so excited to um, hear our guests speak today, and um, we are going to have a Q&A after their talk, so please um, be sure to post your question uh, in the chat, and make sure to um, mute yourself during their talk. Um, everyone should uh, check and be sure that they've done that. Um, a formal kind of statement about our guests today. Um, Caroline Busta is a Berlin-based writer, editor, and consultant working with questions of culture, technology, and globalism. From 2014 to 2017, she served as editor-in-chief of uh, the Berlin-based critical art journal Text zur Kunst. Prior to that, she was an associate editor at Art Forum Magazine in New York. She is the co-founder of New Models, a media outlet for the critical analysis of art, tech, politics, and pop culture with Lil Internet, who is here with us today. Lil Internet is a Berlin-based director, cultural producer, and media critic. And we're just, we're so excited that you're here with us. Um, so the stage is yours. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, thank you to, to Jenna and to Gareth and Michael for the tech support, Brenda. Thank you, Leslie and Don for inviting us as well as all the students. And uh, thanks to all the other guests who are tuning in. Um, so I'm Caroline Busta, as Jenna mentioned, and we're speaking to you from Berlin. Um, I spent most of the past 15 years in the art and publishing world which means I have been surrounded by institutional collapse. As students in UCLA's design and media arts program, you're thinking constantly, not just about content, you know, an essay, a film, a digital experience, but the interfaces people use to access that material and the way those interfaces, that media, shape how people understand each other and the wider world. For the past few years, I've been thinking about this too, in fact, it was this set of questions that compelled me to leave print publishing and start new models. The institutions that had structured the culture sector for some 50 years, like think magazine culture, music labels, broadcast television, movie theaters, even contemporary art institutions were no longer carriers of the cultural zeitgeist. Anecdotally, I remember this first really hitting home watching the big award shows, the Grammys, the Oscars, the MTV Video Music Awards, and being like, this all feels so astroturfed. Even the stars themselves seem to not really believe it. Uh, it yeah, sorry, <laughs> believe it in the mid 2010s, the top down authority of the media had lost its grip. Winning an award from the Academy against the backdrop of volatile surreal politics and a raging meme space seem to confer not a mark of validation, but of delegitimation. Why would you want an award from an institution that no longer understood how to read the wider world? Geopolitical media analyst Martin Gurry speaks about this in terms of legacy media failing to translate the flux of reality into a coherent story. 
as in legacy media can no longer convincingly explain the mess of reality in a way that connects to society's ideals, so people no longer believe in its authority. This was the case in the 1960s, when the old institutions of that time lost the public's trust. But the moment that we're in now has a fundamentally different character than the countercultural break with the institutions that happened in the 1960s. In the talk that follows, we're going to consider why. The aim of this talk is to get you to think about the new psychogeography of culture and how the structural change in the architecture of power means we need to think about culture and cultural critique differently, or perhaps more importantly, new terrain for culture to evolve within. We're also joined today by my new model's co-host, whoops, multidisciplined creator, Lil Internet, who will be adding additional commentary throughout as we worked through some of these ideas together. Hello, thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> um, I'm now going to share my screen. Uh, and let's see. Uh oh, did I close out of it? Oh, wait. Wait a minute. Okay, are we good? I think we're good. Okay. Wait a minute. Caroline, yes, okay. yes, it all looks good. Okay, it looks good, cool. Okay, so we're gonna go through a pretty sweeping talk um, and we're gonna try to hit on these, like, these basic topics. We're gonna go through legacy countercultures. We're gonna do an ultra brief history of the internet. We're gonna talk about subculture online. We're gonna talk about Gen Z etiologies. If you don't know what that is, don't worry, you'll find out. We're gonna talk about how dissent operates online. We're gonna talk about dark forest versus clear net. Again, if you don't know, you'll find out. And then we're gonna talk about mapping the online space with all of this in mind. The core of this comes from a essay that I published in Document, uh, I guess in December, or January, if you count the online or print publication. Um, and so if you've read that article, some of this material will be familiar to you. But since then, we've been thinking a lot about how this dark forest space or these new online communities, how it's, how we have to really think critically about like reconnecting the dots, like recreating new public spaces. So um, we hope that the more scripted part of this talk will like set a groundwork for having a Q&A about where to go from here. Yeah, okay. So here it goes, oops, okay. It's okay. Okay. Um, okay. If you Google image charts counterculture today, the results that come up are mostly black and white or faded color pictures of 1960s youth who today would be in their 60s or 70s. When we look at these pictures, it's so clear what they were countering. The man, the white heteronormative professional man in his suit and tie with a salary job and a car. This man was the avatar of oppression. To resist the man was to resist all the oppressive isms racism, sexism, nationalism, and so on. This version of counterculture assumed a binary. The man was bad, the people were good. And it assumed that were the man to be overtaken by the people, anything was possible, even utopia. The culture sector of the 70s and 80s also operated with the man versus people binary in mind. And some artists experimented with taking this logic to the extremes. As late as the early 90s, abjection and extreme profanity were still working pretty well to resist the man in two key ways, repelling pearl-clutching conservatives with their anti-progressive ideology, and moreover, staving off market recuperation, you know, here of like selling out, right? These being the two big cultural threats at the time. You might think here of cinema of transgression, which you see on the screen, which was so vile, it could only be shown in art house theaters or private screenings. And this is Richard Kern's You Killed Me First from 1985 featuring Lungleg and the artist David Wonorowitz. And they're having uh, a turkey dinner. And then I think they like proceed to kill each other. It's like, I mean, it's like funny. It's so ridiculous. It's so, it's so like over the top, right? Um, another example, of course, is musician Gigi Allen, who regularly fought with his audience. He was known to defecate on stage and perform songs like I'm going to rape you while wearing an American flag loincloth. We might also think here of artist and noise musician Boyd Rice, 
who in what he reports was a prank, joined the founder of the white supremacist group American Front in a 1989 photo shoot for an article Sassy Magazine, the teen magazine, Sassy Magazine, was running on neo-Nazis. And millennials like myself might even remember the black and white parental advisory labels uh, when they first appeared on tapes and CDs, which for kids like me meant cool, bad stuff inside, no parents allowed. <laughs> uh, if you can imagine it, these labels were the center of a huge news cycle, uh, a real hysteria with politicians, Senate hearings and all, uh, all talking about the terrifying influence of bad words in music. Uh, it was the man quite literally sticking something back to the counterculture, in this case, an <laughs> actual big black and white sticker. In, these, in, in context, these artists, like the psychedelic hippies of yore, were being literally countercultural. Like they were using culture against itself to violate the, hegemon the hegemonic push towards neoliberal responsabilization and the oppressive norms of the nuclear family. In today's online space, however, this strategy breaks down. Brought back into the spotlight in 2018 via a New York gallery exhibition of pretty visually innocuous abstract paintings, Boyd Rice quickly found himself at the center of controversy. As his decades old sassy magazine appearance, among other old stunts, he was into like Anton LaVey, the Church of Satan. It was like, it was like stuff that was so bad, it was almost kitschy, um, but it's dependent on context. Um, anyway, this caused a social firestorm and Rice being an old punk, well, when everyone got upset, he just said, I guess he's quoted in artnet.com as saying like, I guess I'm too dangerous for New York City. Well, that may be true, but he wasn't too dangerous for the internet. High tension discussion of his work and life and the gallerist's moral legitimacy raged online, which is to say was intentionally successful online. In an era more profoundly organized by big tech than our own elected governments, the new culture to be countered isn't singular or top-down. It's rhizomatic, non-binary, and includes all of us as part or at least all of us living within the digital ecosystem of Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. I guess that's speaking about the American stack. In China, it's a different situation, but I guess we'll keep this focused on like a Western spectrum for the purposes of this talk. So let's take a second and sketch out very briefly the history of the internet. <laughs> you know, a small, small thing to do, but we'll just take a minute. Um, I want you to keep two things in mind. One, the internet is rooted in former countercultural ideals. Two, it is working exactly as designed. If you're interested in this, I highly recommend Fred Turner's 2006 book, Counterculture to Cyberculture, which gives this transition play by play. But okay, how does the internet begin? In the late 1950s and 60s, something we called ARPANET is developed in the United States as a military research tool, a Cold War era defense technology for better modeling the world through the processing of big chunks, well, big for 1960 chunks of data. And I guess this is also in Russia, they were also developing. Yeah, uh, OGAS, I, I believe it was called, yeah. which is a centralized kind of uh, cybernetic command economy, uh, proto-internet that uh, in the communist view would uh, uh, enable them to run all of their industries and, and factories perfectly by crunching all of the big data um, in a way, I guess, I guess the industrial version of how China uh, has a, a sort of social uh, currency, a, a social credit system right now mm. managing its population. Right. Well, at the time, it seemed pretty exciting to uh, a bunch of visionary tech hippies who saw the unifying potential of a digitally connected whole earth and built a movement in its name. I mean, also we might keep in mind that the CIA was actively researching lysergic acid at the time. So it wasn't like these two worlds were completely separate, but it is interesting. It's like a military defense like research project, which then gets adopted by a, like a utopic group of like tech adjacent creatives. All of whom were dropping acid. All of whom were dropping acid or dosing each other or whatever. As the internet was popularized in the 90s and early aughts, a new age of tech-focused entrepreneurs innovated how to put the World Wide Web to work, building what would become the primary infrastructure of the post-millennial neoliberal order. In a way, this grand narrative sounds like counterculture saving technology from its military makers, only to be taken over by the forces of capitalism. It's not. As Fred Turner unpacks in his book, all three parties, 
the early US Defense Department researchers, the Whole Earth Catalog Utopians, and the startup founders, as well as the state leadership elected in the wake of Reagan and Thatcher, shared a widespread affection for rejecting traditional forms of governance and empowering technology-enabled elites. So here you have the technology-enabled elites, descendant from countercultural tech hippies who have rejected traditional forms of governance, right? Like counterculture succeeded. Uh, and indeed, what they do is in both done in the spirit of radical transparency, and while not exactly democratic, is informed by the activity of billions. This fact can make it difficult to articulate how to hold the tech leaders accountable. If pressed, they may even illustrate how the tools and spaces they've designed reflect the countercultural demands of earlier generations. They are anti-hierarchical, driven by conscientious capitalism, and outwardly encourage personal fulfillment. I mean, they might even post about it on the same social media as you or me. Uh, today, you can be a coder and a DJ, an Uber driver and a travel blogger, a Sand Hill Road suit and a robot heart burner. You can be Jeff Bezos wearing Lil Nas X's jacket. The richest man in the world is really crazy and really cool. <laughs> With digital platforms transforming legacy countercultural activity into profitable, high engagement content, being countercultural no longer means being counter hegemonic. What logic could possibly be upended by leather gays and cyber ravers, let alone punks, goths, gabbers, and neo pagans, when the internet, a massively lucrative space of capitalization, profits off the personal expression and political conflict of its users? In the age of social media, personal expression has become the most valuable form of currency. Yet we still use the term counterculture to describe things that have the look of transgression, even if it's only really transgressive relative to the hegemonic forces of yesteryear. Similarly, slippy, sl bleh, bleh. Similarly slippery is the new look of power. Far from present day strongmen like Viktor Orban, Kim Jong-un and Trump with their parades, palaces and outside girths, the most iconic tells you'll find among the big tech set are more likely a t-shirt that perfectly hugs a bicep, maybe a Patagonia fleece and my favorite, the absence of carrying bags. Like they're never carrying stuff, right? What, that's like the luxury. It's a flex to be visually indistinguishable from the mainstream. The power of today is firmly situated in minimalism, restraint, and ease. I mean, that's also their fashion, right? It's only power under threat that turns to physical displays of strength. Actual power is controlling the means by which lesser power can be displayed. 52.7 million followers? Yeah, at Jack still owns all your tweets. Actual power keeps low profile. Actual power doesn't need a social media presence because it owns social media. In recent years, users have started to register this shift. Yet the term counterculture still gets used to describe someone like rapper Takeshi69, whose notoriety first breaking society's, uh, society's code by through sexual abuse, murder conspiracy, among other offenses, and then breaking the Omerta code of the streets by snitching on fellow gang mm. members to lessen his own sentence. Uh, this all propelled him to superstardom. Gooba, a track he surprised dropped upon being surprised released from prison, made YouTube history by becoming the most watched rap video in a 24 hour span, uh, frying the platform's view counter. That same day, 2 million simultaneous users tuned into his Instagram live as 6ix9ine confessed to his phone camera, yeah, I snitched, I ratted, but who was I supposed to be loyal to? And then with a sparkle and flash of VVS diamonds, I broke the YouTube. At 5 million views, I'm at 5 million views in one hour. A rat is doing more numbers than you and numbers don't lie. But behind 6 ix 9 self-loyalty is an unwitting loyalty to the platform and by extension to the shareholders of Alphabet and Facebook Inc. And 6 9 became a star of the technology enabled hegemony. Eschew tradition, embrace the attention economy above all else and you will be rewarded. And this is where it gets really tricky. To be truly countercultural today, one has to, above all, betray the platform, which may come in the form of betraying or divesting from your online self. 6 ix 9 is subcultural, but he isn't countercultural. Someone like Edward Snowden, by comparison, isn't subcultural, but may be the closest we get to a countercultural figure in the post-digital age. A U.S. government sub 
uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a U.S. government subcontractor with access to classified intelligence, Snowden saw big tech's radically scaling power and in 2013 exposed NSA's illegal agreements with major tech platforms to intercept the private email, call records, and cash of, quote, almost anything done on the internet by users worldwide. Snowden's whistleblowing targeted a major chakra of the new hegemony, resulting in great personal compromise. But a single individual isn't an entire counter culture. Culture, counter, sub, or otherwise, requires a group, us against the world. And the internet is excellent at bringing groups together around collective dissent. But just like the internet, there is nothing inherently socially progressive about these tools, right? Like the internet isn't a force for good, it's not a force for bad. It is like a force, and depending what you put in it, you're gonna get different kinds of results. Extinction Rebellion is countercultural, for instance, um, but so too is QAnon, also the armed right-wing libertarian Boogaloo Boys in the US, uh, and Europe's Reichenberger, who deny the existence of present-day Germany, claiming to be citizens of the Third Reich, which they argue never ended. A pivotal truth specific to our time is that dissent against one level of authority is now very often driven by a deeper hegemonic force. Perhaps this is why, among many younger people, Greta Thunberg notwithstanding, there is less focus on battling current leaders and more interest in divining counter futures, less an attempt to dismantle the master's house using the master's tools, and more something like, let's pull crypto to book the master's Airbnb and use the tools we find there to forge a forest utopia that the master could never survive. Central to this counter future crafting is a strong belief in impending ecological collapse, rendering all the existing systems of control obsolete, which is a logical workaround for thinking about dissent in a time when the socially and ecologically corrosive systems are deemed too sprawling to effectively counter or boycott. The apocalypse is inevitable, the club will close, and we aren't the owners, so all we can do is find the best after party. Another key factor is Gen Z's rediscovery of politicalcompass.org, which through a multiple choice interface allows users to generate an approximate position on an X, Y axis from left to right, authoritarian to libertarian. Some of you may already be familiar with the work of artist Joshua Citarella. This meme is from Josh's Instagram. Like new models, Josh has a content stream and a richly generative Discord community. Having spent the past several years intensively studying the development of Gen Z's online political expression, and I should say a subsector of Gen Z, I mean, <laughs> you know, these generational terms are like placeholders for a movement at, at best, um, but a subsector of Gen Z, a prominent one. Allow, but anyway, so he, he, he's been researching like this generation and uh, he noticed something that he calls ideologies, radical politics as a form of niche personal branding. What you see here is an XY grid of the mean character Wojak and is cast in a whole spectrum of different political uh, identities. So yeah, you can see like the alt-right troll is hugging a Pepe. The anti-fascist is well dressed like Antifa. Um, I mean, uh, it's not, you, you, can, you can unpack it yourself. Um, in Josh's view, Gen Z with its diminished job prospects and hardcore nudging from the platforms to self-monetize treats online identity construction as a key part of growing up and possibly also a key space for competition and transgression. Within this logic, the political compass and the conventions of gaming more generally have become central to what Josh calls a choose your character, choose your future mode of identity play that gained heightened relevance as American politics subsumed all pop culture during the mid 20 teens. And it's true. I mean, the pop culture that we've been exporting in America, I mean, I'm saying this from Germany, but I say this because this is what we also see in Germany is politics. That is a form of pop culture, right? So it would make sense that political identities would be a political identities built on this spectrum of ideologies would be what maybe like being into underground music was in the nineties. Um, so to give you some examples, like one of the big ones is Ted K was right or Ted was right, which is like a kind of anarcho primitivism or anprim, which following Ted Kaczynski's manifesto industrial society and its futures promotes a reactionary return to pre-industrial times 
where people, reskilled as hunters and gatherers, are no longer alienated from their labor and seek fulfillment through mere daily survival. Um, and the world building can get pretty absurdist, but it's also an exercise of real pattern recognition, just extrapolated to a totalizing global scale. For instance, uh, the microdose thought leader pitch sermon ideology imagines a world led by microdosing thought leaders who inspire the masses to join them in manifesting a techno utopia. Uh, anyone who's on the app Clubhouse has probably already encountered uh, exactly this. Yes. And maybe here we have another aesthetic counter to the liberal non-style of big tech. If janky 20th century power displays itself as fashy, organized military parades and presidential private jets, Gen Z displays its potential as a raging semiotic meltdown of meme culture, where the only ideological no-go no zone is the liberal center. Key here is that most of this activity is happening under the guise of avatars, pseudonyms, and collectively run social media accounts where direct lines between IRL subjects and online personas are rarely clear. The niche personal branding is gamified. Push an account to the extreme, see what happens. If the platform shuts you down, start over. The switch from a countercultural framework to one that is competitive futurist, as we might call this, makes a ton of sense in an era when the complexity of global crises and the pro-social positions of corporate leaders makes it exceedingly difficult to effectively isolate responsible parties. And here's Bezos posting to his Instagram about buying Seattle's key arena. Um, and he's saying that, oh, he's not gonna name it Amazon arena. He's gonna name it Climate Pledge Arena and that it will be the first net zero certified arena in the world. No matter the darker side of Amazon, Bezos is giving us a story that aligns with society's ideals. It's a similar situation with Apple and its pro-social, pro-individual empowerment narratives. Like how can one hold Apple accountable for all of the externalities within say, the life of an iPhone? And who among us could easily give up our connectivity and still be economically and socially okay? Like it's a fantasy space to say you're just gonna do without this. Intuiting that any activity directly opposing the system will either be invisible or only make the system stronger, the next generation is instead constructing alternate futures that abandon our current infrastructure entirely. We see this both, for instance, in the emergence of blockchain-based currencies. We also see this in calls to not merely reform, but fully abolish the police. People are calling for a full system change, right? Yet even these layers that would be totally unthinkable a decade ago are ripe for co-optation. GameStop is actually another good example of how a binary counterculture of the people versus man no longer tracks. Through the Robinhood app, anyone with a government ID and a bank account over 18 can trade. When used en masse, as it was to pump up the valuation of GameStop in January, it is capable of hobbling members of the legacy investment world. Yet at the same time, you have Musk, one of the wealthiest people on earth, promoting the GameStop squeeze that Robinhood app facilitated and also shilling for Bitcoin. Rich guys are fashioning themselves as comic book superheroes, alternating between being one of us and secretly building space rockets to save the world or really colonize Mars. <laughs> but creating spaces where they and their platforms can't extract value from us seems vital. And to do so, anonymity, or at least pseudo-anonymity, pseudo is increasingly important, if not fundamental, to being active online in counter-hegemonic ways. In part, this is because one of the biggest impediments to countercultural activity, besides the fact that it's, there's not a binary, uh, is the fact that the internet doesn't suppress expression. As Byung-Chul Han and Gia Tolentino and others have noted, it forces you to express, then holds you accountable for whatever you say for years. On the platform, silence isn't an option, at least not if you want the network to remember you exist. This is especially true in the culture sector where being visible means pinging potential freelance clients with your content, the clients you need to survive and who will only hire you if they are regularly reminded you exist through the sea of noise they swim through every day. Likewise, uh, the increasing devaluation of creative skills means far greater scale is necessary to capture enough of the diminishing returns. 
there's a reason why 6 9 is obsessed with breaking the YouTube and why talented young rappers must be as talented in social media marketing as they are in music if they ever hope to build a successful career. Yeah. We saw this dynamic metastasize last year in the wake of George Floyd's murder when well-intentioned claims of silence is violence, recalling the powerful 1987 ACT UP Silence Equals Death campaign, spiraled into calling out individuals with even a small following who hadn't come forward with a timely public statement of solidarity or remorse. Yet public posts were subject to popular scrutiny and judged based on sincerity, originality, and tone. Not surprisingly, many people defaulted to posting a somber plain black square. But this generated criticism of its own by clogging the feed with an informational blackout during a moment when community resource sharing was critically important. Amid a chaotic time, the platform functioned exactly as as, as designed. Amplification of emotions, uptick in user interaction, growth in platform engagement and data cultivation, cha-ching, the platform cashes in. What's really messed up about this, though, is that users, despite understanding this, despite understanding that the platform's mechanics are net bad, they still feel a moral responsibility to obey the platform-enabled hive mind's rules. Like uh, the film Starship Troopers, (laughs) the platforms thrive on maintaining a forever war and are always asking, would you like to know more? Yeah. Well, to recap this prehistory a bit, we just went through like a sweeping, like a sweeping narrative. Um, we just went over a history of the internet, how it's the result of old countercultural ideals, how the individuals responsible for its current form continue to uphold these ideals, and that they represent a new kind of power, one that cannot easily be opposed. We then talked about how the platforms recuperate legacy forms of transgression, how subculture builds the power of the platforms, and that there is nothing the platform likes more than dissent and conflict. We also opened a door to how some members of Gen Z are using platforms anonymously and pseudonymously to imagine alternate futures. So this is the part of the presentation where I want to shift our focus to spatializing regions of our engagement online. Um, So we sort of have this history, we sort of hopefully have some plan of like, okay, you can have a, uh, like a part of society that's not working, and then you could have a part of society that wants to change that, and it doesn't work according to the old 1960s lines of hegemony and counterculture, like that's no longer a viable divide, we can't think that way any longer. Furthermore, the spaces of communication, these digital platforms are not helping us get greater clarity. Um, They are pitting us against each other and they're draining us of resources. So we wanted to now map out what we see as the new spaces that people are populating. As online activity began to centralize around search engines, such as Netscape Explorer and Google in the late, oh oh yeah, (laughs) in the late 90s and early 2000s, the internet bifurcated into what became known as Surface Web or ClearNet, which includes all publicly indexed sites, big social media, commercial platforms, and anything crawled by major search engines, and the dark net or deep web, which is not publicly indexed due to it being built on anonymized encrypted networks such as Tor. While the darker regions of this chart get a bad rap, they also carry forward an ethos that valued the radical freedom of a hacker ideal where people could communicate anonymously and therefore unburdened by their physical bodies and government names. The logic of the deep web also laid the groundwork for today's sub clearnet space, which we might think of as a dark forest zone. Discord servers, encrypted messaging apps, Reddit and 4chan and so on, where users can interact without revealing their IRL identity or have this activity impact their real name SEO. Dark forest is a term popularized by Kickstarter founder Yancy Strickler that it comes from the title of a 2009 book by Chinese sci-fi writer Liu Chinchin, wherein humans are advised to avoid communication with aliens as it will lead to to human society's annihilation. This isn't a perfect analogy for what we're talking about here, but I like the general sense of it and the image, so we'll use it in an adapted form to describe a region of the web that has grown increasingly important for users of all political persuasions. In part, this is because it is less sociologically stressful 
than the clear net zone, where one is subject to peer, employer, and state exposure. Another reason may be the fact that in the dark forest, which in 2021 now includes creator to fan platforms like Substack and Patreon, one forages for content or shares in what others in the community have retrieved rather than accepting whatever the platform algorithms happen to match to your data profile. Additionally, dark forest spaces are both minimally and straightforwardly commercial. There is typically a small charge for entry, but once you're in, you're free to act and speak without the platform nudging your behavior or extracting further value. Uh, just to be clear, none of these spaces are perfect and users are just as vulnerable to echo chambers and radicalization in the dark forest part of the web as they are on the pop stack social media, particularly in more conspiracy adjacent spaces, uh, I guess in some cryptocurrency adjacent yeah. <laughs> spaces too, which rely on maintaining a uniform collective hallucination of their particular reality. Uh, a dark forest space could be home to a community of generative, well-intentioned discussion and debate, or it could be a sort of filter bubble on steroids. Yet in terms of engendering some kind of counter-hegemonic potential, the dark forest is more promising due to its relative autonomy from algorithmic direction, data extraction, behavior nudging, and prediction, and the fact that users are less exposed to scrutiny, their words less vulnerable than in clearnet spaces. There are clear benefits to building primary communities out of clear net range. A few more notes on dark forests. They reduce the pressure towards conformity that comes with large crowds, uh, both off and online. And the scale of, of number of people definitely matters. Dark forest communities are often far closer in scale to real life human networks. Uh, the Dunbar number for a tribe is 150 people, uh, which is the number at least a guy named Dunbar believed to be the <laughs> ideal size for engendering healthy agonism among peers who recognize each other as peers. Uh, so they're able to debate each other with the intent of elevating the knowledge base of the community rather than doing it just for personal gains or kicks or in a sort of binary battle for which one person uh, is the victor uh, and the other person goes home uh, with their head hung in shame. Uh, in dark forests, one no longer has these feelings of one's space, i.e. your feed, being invaded in the endless uh, singular uh, flat plane of social media. And when each community has its own island, one can imagine a, a wider solidarity actually becoming more possible. No longer are crabs in the same social media bucket engaged in a forever war with algorithmically wandering strangers. Uh, groups with micro differences in attitudes or beliefs can rally together with uh, around shared macro affinities in causes with other small groups. So in other words, you're not, you, you no longer are fighting over uh, this idea that the whole space can be totalized uh, in agreement with you. And uh, you can work together in smaller groups and join, have these smaller groups join together on a bigger, to solve a bigger problem you all share. Um, to use an anal analog analogies, uh, juggalos uh, come from all different backgrounds and regions. They can even be members of different gangs, but in the end, they are all down with the clown. And this allows them to come together when it counts. <laughs> There is also the question of what kind of institutions and governance we will build in these spaces. And here too, maybe Juggalo show us the way. Um, I made this short list thinking about the core mission of art museums today, uh, and then realized that it actually tracks with, with uh, uh, Insane Clown Posse. Yeah, museums, yeah. <laughs> museums are like the Insane Clown Posse is definitely the hottest take in this talk. Yes, uh, that is true. They distill the truth to society. About they bring clarity to a subject by filtering signal to noise. They, uh, well, they don't, they don't necessarily preserve context, but you know, they're not a museum. This was a, a kind of a mistake, but it works. Intol in intolerant societies creating a haven for expression, I think it works. In any case, healthy dark forest spaces, however, at least in the way we're using this term, this metaphor of dark forest, rely on light leakage. There needs to be an exchange. Where, where will the commons be in the Web3 space? How will closed communities communicate with each other to build wider solidarity? It is absolutely fundamental that we think about this now. 
Otherwise, we may truly find ourselves in a speculative future, so fractured on the ground and so totalizing from above, we will truly have no agency at all. To leave you on a more positive note, I came across this tweet yesterday, and it feels really key. It's from at Aaron Z. Lewis. What if our maps of social media are as primitive as medieval maps of Earth? For now, only a select few have the tools and technical skills to get a bird's eye view of the networks we're embedded in. But I bet network cartography will soon be more, more evenly distributed. And I think that's true. Indeed, as users, we do not have clear maps of social media, let alone the wider web, which we've been somewhat chaotically trying to sketch out for you here. We've only just begun to create a common cartography of the online space. But with this movement towards community-directed spaces, these Web 2.5 spaces, these coming Web 3 spaces that will be built on the blockchain, I imagine we'll see more and more attempts. And perhaps some of you will even be instrumental to how they're drawn. And I want to leave you actually with one, let's see, with one final image. This is um, an illustration from someone in our community, Jack Ricker, who was trying to spatialize how these different dark forest communities interact. And you can see there's like walls that are built up. So there's these like moats that are, there's walls that are built up that contain water. They contain like, you can pretend that's content or energy or whatever, but they flow into each other, right? They flow into each other. And they're sort of this, this like this grouping of different communities that do, that are defined. It's not individuals who are isolated, they're communities, um, but they, they flow back and forth through each other. So I wanna leave that, that particular image up here as we transition into the next part of this, which is hopefully a, a back and forth between some of you with your questions um, and see if we can, I don't know, further explain anything. Um, but, uh, but I do think this question to mapping is so key. And I think that uh, it will be very exciting to see, um, is that okay? Oh, yeah, it'll be very exciting to see or how our behavior changes when we understand where we exist within the larger, am I using my hands too much? Where we exist within the larger social media spectrum. So thank you very much. Um, and now we're interested in hearing your thoughts in return. Thank you. That was incredibly interesting and so wonderful to um, go through this with, with you. Um, we have, we have a bunch of questions in the chat and um, a bunch of J's as well. J for, for Jack, apparently. If someone wants to explain that one to me, I'm, I'm really interested to know. <laughs> so, so very first um, question that we had in the chat was from uh, Kyle Chamberlain, who wanted to know, um, how does counterculture proliferate without the big platforms? And do the big platforms effectively put a lid on how big countercultural movement can become? Okay, can I start with that? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the word counterculture, I think is just a difficult word right now because it presumes this hegemony that we can see the edges of. Um, I, I'm, and I'm not like a Gramsci scholar and I'm probably like use the word very loosely, uh, but I think counterculture is, is, uh, is, like itself in the proper sense of it, I think is a bit difficult to speak about effectively. But in terms of a form of resistance um, and, and like how, what are the limits of resistance on the big stack social media and how does resistance proliferate or, or like, you know, it's like voice or exit, right? Resistance would be voice, exit would be like, uh, like creating a competitive future, like some new future space. Um, I think we are seeing the limits of it on big stack social media. Um, we can't, we can't conceive of ourselves as a community on social media. We can't see how we are a community. We And we feel too exposed to actually make statements, which, I mean, it's, it's like if you speak on social media, you're speaking to build your own profile or you're speaking to avoid condemnation from somebody else. You're not just speaking in the service of whatever it is that you want to achieve, like on a longer spectrum communal basis. So I think it's not very possible on ClearNet. Um, I think in dark forest spaces, resistance is far more possible because people can find each other with some degree of protection. I think the caveat there is that dark forest spaces can also harbor radicalizing movements, which are net negative for larger society. And I don't know how we how we temper that. I mean, that's the thing we also, I mean, we see a lot of like 
what are, can be clearly recognized as countercultural movements right now, um, uh, adopting extremely toxic uh, politics. Um, so, you know, it is, uh, yeah, I, I, th I think that, you know, counterculture is, is not uh, just a, uh, it's not necessarily the vector with which you challenge the uh, authority, is authority right now. Um, but in terms of the question of, of where, um, I mean, I, I think anything that kind of uh, operates closer to a real human community. Um, uh, so, there's accountability. Right, like where there's you... accountability and also there's, a, I mean, a bit of gatekeeping, a bit of actually like really shared codes. I think what happens on the ClearNet big stack social media is that um, the this, this signifiers of counterculture are so easily just adopted, traded, swapped in, out, that um, you know, it, it suddenly kind of very quickly gets reduced to a as a very superficial uh, sort of expression and a, a very watered down or commercialized version of what it used to be. I mean, these it's just uh, I mean the way like you know even fashion works today. Uh, you you can see that it's it's almost like trying on different archetype. Uh, uh, outfits of, of different archetypes. Well, it's like a so, face filter almost. Yeah. It's just like you're trying different face filters or something, especially in like a COVID time. And so, I mean, I also think though, just for that reason, I, I think like, you know, these, these very defined visual aesthetics of, of countercultures also aren't uh, aren't really essential the to them, even though we- right. Right. It becomes There's more subculture. Sub, more subculture, yeah. right. But um, anyways, yeah. I, I think you talk about vibe scaling too. And maybe you can just relay what you said on the like the Discord today about like there was an argument about like nuclear power and uh, it got very heated and your intervention was like. Well, uh, are the vibes scalable? I right. mean, but this is something really about managing smaller I guess it's more that kind of a right? question. But it has to do but with like, yeah, I guess. It's building, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as your community grows, you have to make sure that there is a, of course, a, a, you, you want dispute, you want agonism, you want people to be able to uh, express uh, opposing views and help work each other out uh, and in, uh, persuade or instruct each other. Um, there won't always be absolute consensus, but you really want to make sure that it, it happens in a way where the community as a whole um, stays together and wants, uh, and is, be is be benefits uh, after all of these sort of little conflicts right. or agonism or arguments uh, happen. So I always say like, uh, I mean, this is obviously like a, a little bit of a, a funny phrase because it kind of borrows from like Silicon Valley language, but I'm like, guys, like, you know, like, like th these vibes aren't scalable. We need vibes that are scalable. Like, <laughs> can we take these vibes and really build like a mass movement with them? That's the kind of vibes we need. Right. The order, vibes right. are going to obviously be fracturing people or actually like bring the community down or spread, uh, get into flywheels of conflict. You don't right. want those vibes. So I guess that's <laughs> the end. The answer to the question is vibes. So <laughs> if you can find a place, maybe you find that on a clear net and that's great. If you can find a place where you can scale your vibes towards your movement, then you found a good place for you. Scalable vibes. <laughs> can I get that on a shirt? <laughs> <laughs> good one. <laughs> Hey, thanks. <laughs> we have so many more questions, um, but I think that that actually leads really well to this um, question by uh, Connor Hinson, which was, um, what use does gatekeeping have in maintaining subculture? On platforms like TikTok, there's been a reaction against gatekeeping. You can be accused of gatekeeping for refusing to reveal any tiny piece of information, like uh, where, you brought, where you bought your clothes um, and they're also thinking of DJs who uh, post their track list via uh, versus DJs who don't. Mm -hmm. So, um, how how can you kind of respond to to gatekeeping on these platforms? I mean, the one thing I just want to say right off is that like there's a kind of pressured trolling what you get online, where like there's this hive mind consensus of something you should do, and then people will troll you to make you do it. That sometimes puts you in a place of greater vulnerability. And there's sometimes Which is something that having yeah. a tight, smaller, dark forest community like protects against. Exactly. And so like I think that's one, yeah, one of the, the problems of ClearNet is that you constantly have to like 
I, I mean, you're, there's a pressure to constantly dox yourself and to constantly like show all your cards and, you know, prove, prove like whatever, however much money you make or, or to like, to show you don't make that much. If you're asking for a GoFundMe or like whatever it is, you're constantly having to like prove yourself. And I think that that in itself is like, is negative on the flip side. I mean, you ask about like DJs and maybe you want to speak to that, that aspect of it, like posting their lists. Well, I mean, I, I just think though, and this also gives me deja vu about, uh, a similar conversation with like the NFT craze about uh, there's this sort of romantic idea that NFT artists are like breaking down the gatekeeping walls of the real art world so that people can spend a million dollars on like a visual joke about day trading. <laughs> like it's like, you know, the, uh, like all gatekeeping isn't good. All gatekeeping isn't bad. Like they're like, uh, you know, when with absolute no gatekeep gatekeeping, in networks and in uh, a creative space where scale now matters more than anything, you're going to quickly reduce things into sort of the most popular middle of uh, the, the most popularity, middle of the popularity bell curve, like facsimiles of, of the same thing that just uh, works the best. So, I, I mean, I, I first of all I would say don't, <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't be like, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't like accept someone acute like take it personally if someone accused you of gatekeeping for protecting uh, any. I think different different spaces property, can have different you know? degrees of gatekeeping. Yeah. I mean, we were very clear that when we started new models, we wanted a space that was gatekept. I mean, it's gatekept by a five dollar admission fee. It's not like it's like totally inaccessible, right? But we knew that if people were going to come and view the content there, that they were somehow personally invested in it. They had gone through some filter themselves. They wanted to join us actively. It wasn't like they were just going to opportunistically glide in and like drag us because they found something that they could take out of context. It's also gatekept from uh, activity or sorry, vibes that are do that harm the community That's as right. a whole. Yeah, right. Like, so like we um, think of it as like SPF protection, like a kind of gatekeeping that's just like, you know, keeps the like the ultraviolet rays from killing you. Um, but you still want some sun on your face. So I don't know, it's a balance. Uh, you know, I would say also the don't, don't, you know, don't gatekeeping as an individual from your peers, from your community is one thing, but gatekeeping from like the every, everything from the everywhere space. Yeah. Like that's, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with, um, well, it's especially... kind of like this diagram actually. I mean, like walls are helpful because they retain water. You need that, but you know, it's also nice to like share your water or let it spill into other pools. So it's kind of, I mean, again, I guess it's just, yeah, it's the balance. Also should an, art, should an artist in a financially precarious space who uh, created a set of tools themselves that enable them to make a living, support people in need, like should they share that proprietary tool with people who are already in much more privileged positions. I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's just as a blanket. I mean, the internet loves to work in absolutes and it loves to- And then use them disingenuously. <laughs> and use them disingenuously. And it also loves to present this model of the world as if it's something that can be totalized, as if it can be reduced to universal, simple rules. And that's just an illusion. It's it's not yeah. true. But it's a great question. It's one yeah, that it's, I think, yeah, we'll, everyone will have to continue to ask. Um, I'll also, why don't we unshare for now so that we can uh, oh, sure. see our faces larger okay. now. Um, stop share. Thank okay. you. Cool. Hello. Hi. Uh, <laughs> so another question from Conrad. Um, do you see the fusion of memes with uh, economy as a threat to cybercultures impact and integrity? Um, you did mention NFTs. So what they said was, um, is it possible that the NFT fueled meme economy actually uh, is promise is a promising area for creators, freeing them from gatekeepers. Hmm. I mean, I think those gatekeepers are all falling away. I mean, like if you look at like what happened to Condé Nast, I mean, like you know, 15 years ago, like you could never imagine that Condé Nast would basically, you know, now if you go to their page, they don't list their magazines, they list their brands. I mean, they're no longer a media company, exactly, right? They're like a brand. They're like a branding agency basically. Um, and 
I, you know, I, I think it's more like, this is why we stress the competitive futurist paradigm, because I think it's less like how to dodge gatekeepers and more like how to build your own gardens that like renders the old gatekeepers obsolete. Right. Um, so that's like my first thought, um, but we I would, I would cut you off. No, no, it's, it's, it's fine. I mean, I was going to say like, you know, I mean, the NFT conversation is, is a really fraught one. I, I think it's really, really great that it, it can, uh, it can provide funding or income to artists who are in a, in a pre precarious space or don't have funding or income because it's very difficult to find as a, a creative producer these days. At the same time, I think the gatekeeping argument is probably like the weakest one. We're, we're in a cycle right now of like this breaking down all the gates. And what's going to happen is that art is going to get really repetitive and really well, it's uninteresting. It's not art. I mean, I, here's the statement. Well, it's not art. It's like, I'm I mean, I know- I'm using that in lowercase no, 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 exactly. Let's not get into <laughs> okay, that okay, okay. But right, well, essentially all the gates are going to be broken down. There's going to be a lot of repetitive and boring stuff. I mean, already the stuff that's like really popular sells for a lot. So the market judges it the best is like literally jokes like actual visual puns, like that's the most about the market. Like, so obviously that's not a good, like, yay, no gatekeeping. Look, we have like a, a, a animated bull and it's called bull market. Isn't it great? Like this is what art should have always been. Like, no. And, and I think eventually new gatekeepers will get created anyways. Because well, they already are. The cycle, I mean, like essentially it already is. Now it's like, how big is your crypto portfolio? I mean, Can you- right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, that's the other funny thing. There was a scare when the, uh, the, the Beeple work sold at the Christie's auction. Um, the yes, guy who lost it by a matter of seconds, and he was very mad he lost it, is actually like one of the most hated guys in, in cryptocurrency. And I saw I'm in some WhatsApp group with some people who are like very into it. Um, I'm like the one like skeptic in the group and they don't want to hear from me. Um, it, but anyways, like I saw their like euphoria and made like, yes, we've been validated. Like, uh, like NFT art is real. Like it just melted away because the person who bought it was they, they believe was like the worst person ever. So it was, how is it validated if the worst person ever is the one validating it? Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think though, like, I don't know, go for it. It's a great thing for artists if they can find funding or income or make a living I mean, that way. Like why, why not? But the gatekeeping think, thing, I think is it's going to be a cycle regardless. But memes themselves are a form of gatekeeping. I mean, like, you know, my mother is on this feed somewhere here. I wonder how much of this presentation she understood, mom, how much you understood. <laughs> but I'm just saying like, there's a, there's a level of legibility, right? Like, and, and only if you're in certain communities, are you going to be able to read the, like, are you going to be able to like, uh, interpret what's happening. So memes form their own kind of gatekeeping. And maybe that's like worth also keeping in mind. Yes, absolutely. Um, memes, memetics, they're, they're absolutely just um, something that can be exclusive if you're not kind of deep in these realms or on these platforms. Um, we, we have a bunch more questions, but it's 11 o'clock. So um, for those of you who need to go, um, let's, let's thank our guests. But I, I would like to get a couple more of these questions in if any of you want to um, kind of linger a little bit longer. Um, so um, another question for you is um, from Daniel. Um, are dark forests radical or are they an indication of the way these subcultural groups are incapable of making radical counter future or <laughs> making radical counter future into a livable space? I mean, in the root term of radical, they're radical in that they are breaking off and they are a kind of root system, which is happening like outside of clear net space. So I would say in that sense, in that like one sense, yes. Um, but um, I mean, I think that's a good point, right? Like, I think there is like a lot of frustrated energy that ends up in these spaces and they're like an exhaust valve for it. Um, you know, I think that some of those communities will find each other in these dark forest spaces and maybe produce something in physical space, which is like more useful. Um, I think that others, others will dwindle. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, they, they can, and they, some can be some, some aren't, but I agree that like, uh, you know, we've met people in real life through the new models community and new model space. And we have 
uh, made strong networks that now have kind of uh, spread outside of just the online community yeah, itself, sure. uh, creating things, working together uh, uh, on actual, uh, I don't know, objects or creative projects, et cetera. So um, I think it can, it, it, it certainly, when it comes to the online space, at least, it's uh, it feels a lot more like real organizing, you know, uh, or real. It feels like a lot more radical potential there. I'll also say though that like I think that when we talk about dark forest spaces, we're talking about Web 2.5, and that we're on our way to something which is like more, uh, like more sophisticated that will include uh, kinds of local currencies. Um, as as people, I mean, one thing that's big now is this idea that if you have a Patreon, then like your whole community is bound to that Patreon or is bound to that platform. But if Patreon were to like drop off, then you'd lose your community, right? We're still dependent, like we are dependent on Patreon for like our monthly income and for communication with like, I guess all of our all of our patrons. And if Patreon were to stop, we'd be, it'd be a big problem. And I think Web3 spaces, are moving towards a place where communities own themselves. There is a kind of tokenization, which is you know built on the blockchain and you don't need Patreon to be your intermediary platform. When that happens, and then when communities can issue tokens, which can maybe also like rise in value, you're going to, like the idea of selling out is gonna be a lot different, right? And, um, and when your community can actually form a currency and form a kind of like cultural value that has like a financial component, maybe, I mean, good and bad stuff will be able to happen. But um, I do think that there is increasingly the potential for these dark forest spaces, proto web three spaces to have a lot of agency, certainly more than you'd have on the clarinet space. Our last question that we're going to um, look at today, even though there are a couple more, um, I think feeds really well into that, which is um, Isaac asks, uh, they say, I'm I'm curious about how you think caregiving practices map differently in dark forest and clear net spaces. And more broadly, if the sort of caregiving that undergirds communal resistance is possible in online spaces. Hmm. I mean, one of the first, oh, did you have something else you're gonna say? Okay. Well, I, if Isaac is still here, I, I was curious if um, they wanted to elaborate on caregiving and, and the communities that they're referring cool. to. Um, are you yeah. here, Isaac? Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, loved your talk. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm. I was just think like this is really coming from uh, having watched that documentary Crip Camp recently, and having been incredibly moved by uh, the way that uh, caring for one another kind of undergirded um, their ability as uh, a truly kind of radical movement of people who were really profoundly shut out and uh, unable to uh, even access you know the, um, the 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 dominant culture in many ways uh, and so being able to uh, for these short the, this short summer uh, 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 span care for one another in this uh, uh, changed way kind of grounded their ability to uh, uh, be resistant in the future. And um, I've also just been having this conversation with friends of mine about, you know, <clears throat> if there's kind of a resistant possibility online, does that have to be grounded in a sort of ability to be intimate with one another and care for each other in a group? And is that possible? It definitely helps to be like grounded in physical space for sure. And to remember, we do have bodies attached to these hands and minds. Um, totally. I mean, I know like, it wasn't about mutual aid, but what do you want to say? I mean, I just know anecdotally and personally, I feel like you, you in at least smaller, more private online groups, you can, you feel a little bit more of a deeper connection. And there is a lot of sort of at least uh, in terms of sharing advice or support for substance abuse issues or mental health, um, there is certainly like a strong network built on within our own community. And there's also local connections made to some degree as well. I think on the ClearNet, you have the benefit of scale. So something like a GoFundMe, et cetera, it seems to work, tends to work better there. Um, but I, I think it does at least add a little more uh, of a 
a little more of an emotional or deeper, more intimate connection with the people in your group, which then can bleed over into the real world, which I think is, you know, that's probably the most important part. Um, I mean, this year when we were like seeing so, we, you know, we had so many fewer uh, chances for social interaction. Um, I, I think it was only through digital spaces that we would then meet somebody IRL, right? Like it was, we, we found them online. Oh, like you have a certain situation. Um, you need help with something real. Okay. Here's my excuse to like break my quarantine and go and meet you and do this thing with you. Um, and so I think there are certainly agents of, of care. Um, I, uh, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I just think we can't lose the physical. I think the physical is, is so important. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, ideally they would work sym symbiotically. Um, yeah, ideally they work symbiotically, I guess. Thank you for that question, Isaac. Um, yes, and, and thank you so much to everyone else. Um, we're going to have to cut it off here. This has been an incredibly interesting talk and thank you so much for visiting us. And thanks to all of our guests for coming. Thank you all thank so you. much. Thank you, Isaac, really for the question. It. And yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Don and Leslie. Um, and uh, thank you, Jenna and UCLA. And we're excited to also, yeah, you know, we'd love to continue the conversation with you. If you're interested, you can always go to our website and you can just like write in the comment box or else you can write at desk at newmodels.io and send us your thoughts and comments. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. It was excellent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's fantastic. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Ciao. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>